Hey, this is Matt once again. What about the end of the video? There's another paid request, this time for Johnny. Thank you so much for that. For those interested in requesting pretty much any type of videos, topics, reactions, reviews, re-reviews, uh, randomness, out of the blueness, whatever it may be, uh, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. And Johnny wanted me to do a commentary on Star Trek First Contact. So, I have a brought up here. I'm paused at the beginning. Like I said, for those interested in requesting pretty much any type of videos, feel free to send either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. So let's count down. 3, 2, 1, pressing, play. And we have Paramount logo. Again, this is for syncing. Firecom Company, and we're fading out now. Paramount Pictures presents in for sinking. A Rick Berman production, and when I mean sinking, I mean for those who want to follow along. So, start your first contact. I do like this film. I do think it's the best of the next generation movies. That's not saying much though, because I think the others suck. Now. With Star Trek, I grew up with the original crew. I grew up with Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Scotty, those characters. I love the original show. I like to get on Blu-ray someday. I have the DVDs of them. I don't have the DVDs that has the new effects in it. I have the older DVDs. The the movies. I like all six of the movies, even five for its flaws. I do like it. I love Star Trek The Motion Picture. To me, that is the one that really lives up to the word Star Trek. They're going on a trek through the stars. It's an adventure you know, into this unknown thing called V'ger. Yes, there's a lot of people staring at stuff. I understand, but I still felt the adventure quality. I like Star Trek 2. Star Trek 3, I think, has a lot of good character moments. Star Trek 4 is my favorite. Star Trek 5, I think the character moments really work for that film. Like when they look at their inner demon, so to speak. Star Trek 6, damn good one. And then Generations sets my balls. And Generations are so shitty. They're like, we gotta go a little bit more action, a little bit more excitement. Which I know some people don't like these films. They don't like this film included because they felt it was different, too different from the show. Now I've seen a couple episodes of Star Trek: The Next Generation. It just you know it's fine. It just I much prefer the original. I'm just not big Next Generation guy. I'm just not. But from what I understand, they felt that this was not a good representation of. Picard and that Picard is much more action heavy, he's much more action hero, he's much more to what I understand on the show, Picard was much more of a diplomat. Words before actions. But then in these films it was much more action trying to be action. Even a little bit of insurrection, a little bit of nemesis and I know like Red Letter Media, those guys are not a fan of these movies because they felt like the Picard in the movies are different from the Picard in the show. I'd be curious to hear what other people, like my friend Michael Caine, feel about that. I did Picard, as we see here, because this was part of the, the show. I did see this episode where he's turned into this part bored creature. And again, some people don't like the way the board was done in this. Like, there's a queen. Why is there a queen? People, people, some people didn't like that idea. But again, as a guy that has only seen a few episodes of the show, and it's like, eh, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's just, you know, when you watch something, it's like, it's fine. It's just not a preference. Just, yeah, I just prefer... I'm just more of an OG guy. More of an original Trek, the first six movies guy. 
But this is a good one. This is a good one because, again, maybe for people who are very deep into the show, they're not going to like it for this, but I do like that it becomes a... Almost like a little bit of an action horror movie in parts. Like an aliens type of situation where you have this f force inside the ship and they have to go through these corridors and it's this coming out of the woodwork like cockroaches. Like you can't stop them no matter what. And I like this thing with Picard that he has this grudge against them because of what they did to him. I mean, I thought that actually was more buried into the into the character. But again, that's another thing that I want to understand is that in the movies they make it seem as if Picard and Data have this close relationship. But if you actually watch the show, that's far from the case. So it, it's like the Picard and Data and everything in the movies are different from how they are in the show. And this is for me, you know, trying to learn a bit of this. Because you watch bits of the show and to do at least a little bit of research, Picard would be like, just treating Data like one of the crew. Listen to my orders, follow the orders, do that, do that. But they weren't like chummy having, you know, drinks and talking about life and stuff. <clears throat> That's why some people were confused with the new Picard show. Well, they were confused by a lot of things. Like, why does it suck so much? Why is Picard thinking like Data is like his brother when they were barely <laughs> talked to each other on the show? Or at least, other than follow my orders. But yeah, I'm not an expert on the show. I'd be talking out my ass like I have been doing for seven minutes now, so... For those who are gun ho who have seen every episode twice, I mean my friend Michael King, the choice voice, he would be better to answer any of those type of questions. <clears throat> Star Trek Generations, which is the film before this, was such a Technically, I'd probably say that is the worst Star Trek film for me, as it is the one that made me the most mad, most angry, because you kill off Captain Kirk in such a shitty fashion. First off, you have to kill off Captain Kirk. Why? Second off, why you just bring him in to have him at the end cooking some fucking breakfast, has three words on a horse with Picard, and then die falling from a fucking bridge. Like, just leave the ending of Star Trek VI. Maybe Ryan Johnson and J.J. Abrams, they're a big fan of Star Trek Generations. Maybe they're a big fans of that fucking movie. That's what they meant by, we wanted, did J.J. Abrams like, I'll do Star Trek. Maybe his favorite is Generations. Hey, I'll do The Force Awakens. I'll have Han Solo die the same fucking way. But, yeah, Generations, like, if you really wanted to make that film, you would have just the, the crew of the Enterprise, they go through some portal, and they gotta work with these guys on both ships, and they both go on to each ship. Is that the first or last time Kirk and them would go through time travel? They go to the future, they be with these guys, they help together... And th that should have been the story about the Borg. Does that be a hell of a threat? To see Kirk and Spock in them deal with the Borg? That'd be pretty cool. They kind of tried to do that with the, the books that William Shatner wrote. Because there's talks that he didn't really write those books. His name's on them. But the guy, he didn't really write them. Someone else did. Because there were books that, well, uh, Captain Kirk was brought back by the board, and I'm like, I want to see that movie. I'd rather see that movie instead. 
church and Spock at least I deal with the Borg. That'd be pretty damn cool. But anyway. And that film was not really beloved by fans. Understandably so. So, they definitely did an improvement on this. There's Worf, played by Michael Dorn. I think around this time... I think he was in Deep Space Nine. Perhaps today is a good day to die. Of course, Worf was on the Next Generation show, but I think, again, for a bit, he was on Deep Space Nine. Again, that's another show I didn't watch. I didn't, I didn't watch much of Star Trek. So when I say I'm a Star Trek fan, I mean, like, I'm just a Star Trek OG fan. In the first six movies, the three seasons, even the animated series of the original Star Trek. But it does seem like there's those factions. There's ones that like Deep Space Nine the best. There's ones who like Voyager the best. And then, though... STD, Star Trek Discovery, where Star Trek is in a, such a shit show today. But yeah, of course, you have Patrick Stewart here as Picard. It's sad because I think he's one of those guys that have gone off the deep end with his politics and with how they thought Picard should be treated, which I'm like, what? And oh, well, let's, let's have Star Trek not be Star Trek anymore because... That's not feasible in today's climate. I'm like, so you, in other words, go against everything Gene, Rodden, Gene Roddenberry fucking wanted. So now they do this new Star Trek, and it's like, nope. These effects are pretty good. These effects still hold up. Uh, maybe not the ends, but like that's a, I think that's the actual model, that thing coming out. That explosion, I think is model work, that Dupree. But I mean, like, the spaceships, the spaceships still look pretty cool, as is uh, that Borg cube. And the Borg is definitely, an, the I think, the best villain that ever came out of the next generation. Definitely the most interesting. And I do like this personal connection we've seen between Patrick Stewart and the Borg. And... You know, the, the cast do their jobs well. Like, Jonathan Freight's here. <laughs> he has a good sense of humor about it. And, of course, that guy, writer, Jonathan Freight, he directed this film. And did a very capable job. I mean, it's one thing to direct an episode of a show, but to direct a whole movie... I know he would go on to direct a couple of stuff. I think he did a film... Clock Stoppers or Clock... Something like that, and I think he did one other. I think he did the next. I think he did Insurrection, the next one, and that didn't do well. Really, seems like the only good next generation film is this one because of this the board being the villains is a great choice. The almost like this claustrophobic set piece with the board just overtaking the ship. I did like a horror film. Nice twist and take on it. And Patrick Stewart does do a good job. I mean, being this haunted character trying to overcome his anger and you know, Alfie Woodard Call him bullshit on it. Pretty much call him bullshit on Patrick Stewart's holier than thou attitude. Oh, I'm above such things. No, you're not. I'm looking at the rest of the cast. Yeah, Alfre Woodard, James Cromwell, Alice Creed. Here's James Cromwell, the drunk, and there's Alfre Woodard on the left. Alfre Woodard is a good actress. James Cromwell. He would also be in Babe. And Babe 2. Let's see. The idea here being... He's going to 
go up in the ship and get into first contact and that's going to get, set the rules going. Not the rules, but set the events coming of them meeting aliens and establishing technology and all this stuff. The thing is with this film is I do like it, but anytime I've seen this film, this stuff here on Earth, I was never that interested in. I mean, the actors do their jobs well, Jonathan Frakes and you know James Cromwell and them, and it's like, okay, we're doing that to have some levity and sense of humor, but each time it would go back, I was always... Can we go back to the ship? Can we stay on the ship? I'm more interested in what's happening on the ship. With Picard and Data and the Borg and what's happening and how many crew are left and they gotta go outside of the ship with these gravity boots and... There you go, nice torpedoes. Of course, this is a different looking Enterprise because in the last one, it fucking crashed and burned. Which is too bad because I'm not, I mean, the look of the ship looks alright. I, I thought the ship on the shell looked cooler. Because, yes, my favorite is the original Enterprise back in the day. But, or even in Stutcher the Motion Picture, cool looking Enterprise. And then, again, this one looks okay, but I would say my preference, like I said, and then, Next Generation, is that who I think it is? Next to Data, is that? I think that's, uh, oh, what's his name? Is that the guy from, uh, who played Bison in Street Fighter Legend of Chun-Li? Can't believe I forgot his name. I think it is. Yeah, but I think this came out in 1996, which was a pretty damn good year for movies because you had Independence Day, you had Twister, you had Mission Impossible. A lot of big movies coming out around that time. And this film did become a big hit. Critics liked it more. Seemed like, especially at the time, fans liked it more. Again, I nowadays some people look at these and go, well, that's not really how the show was. The show was more about ideas and diplomatic abilities. And can you do that for, your sh for a movie? Can you not? I think they try to be a bit more soulful on the structure of the motion picture. It got destroyed. And, but then Star Trek 2 was the most popular, and that was a bit more of an action film, so I'm sure that's the direction they felt on this. I mean, <laughs> Brent Spiner as Data. I mean, this initial on Earth with Alfie Woodard is fine, and to get maybe Alfie Woodard onto the ship so that you have a different point of view who won't take Picard's bullshit and call him out on his hypocrisy, that is fine. It's just, again, after, you know, constantly cutting back to Cochrane and... I thought, like, eh. Because I don't think it, it helps with the... Con it doesn't 
to me relay a consistent tone. I I like the film, but I like the the first at least five of the six movies. I put I probably put this above part five, Star Trek five, but I would say I like Star Trek one, two, three, four, and six more than this. I did because, like I said, the the tone it was a little bit inconsistent because it keeps coming back to very like goofy humor, getting drunk. Oh, I wonder if we'll make it. Uh, as I were in this deep, we're in some deep shit now, man. And very heavy stuff with Picard and Data. It's like then I don't know. We'll get to that. As I almost want to see a cut of the film just on the Enterprise. But I get it. I get it. It's it's part of the. The importance of this is first. I mean, it's called first contact, so you have to have some screen time about first contact. But I don't know. I don't know. If there's other ways to do it. I just because this is a setup with him touching it creates a little bit of an impression, and Data, who always wants to be human, can't quite grasp it. That's why later on, when the board queen gives him the ability to feel, he's en enticed for I don't know how many milliseconds, he says. But again, like in the show, if I understand, Picard would not be this chummy with Data. And I've seen clips, it doesn't seem like he was, but... I I didn't if that's the case I don't mind the change. I don't like the design like I said, this design of the Enterprise is, is there. Oh, this is when shit's you know, like a horror film going up shit creek. And this is a two disc D V D. I have it this way because the the other way is a really crappy cover. Like this, it's really crappy. And like a horror film. I mean, this could be a fucking xenomorph. You know, grabbing someone and bringing them in. See, it does grab her and pull him in, right? Or No, she goes in, okay. There you go. Oh, he knows. He's psychic. Well, because of his history in the past. Well, damn it. I was going to look at what the features are, but it's not showing what the features are on this for some reason. Yep, because Picard knows we're up shit creek without a paddle. We need to get the fuck back up there. They love heat and conflict. Maybe they're part predator. <laughs> you fucked up, Worf. I left you on duty. Why don't you know what the fuck's going on? You're fired. But yeah, back in the day, I saw Star Trek on VHS. It was VHS that I first saw it. And... There were some VHS tapes of single episodes, and then I had some taped thanks to my, to my aunt. And also some of the animated cartoons, again, thanks to my aunt. Then after that, 
Like I said, had the, the movies on VHS back in the day, including Star Trek, the, the special longer version, as it was called, that you can't fucking find on DVD or Blu-ray anywhere. Yeah, that's Neil Madonna. I think that is, that's the name I'm thinking of. Neil Madonna, who was in... I'm like, damn, usually, like, 99% of the movies he's in sucks, but... He's also in the first Captain America and, and this one, so... But I say it because he's in, like, Street Fighter Legend of Chun-Li, he's in 88 Minutes, he's in the Hitcher remake. He's in a lot of bad movies. Let me see, I'm trying to think. Uh, like I said, I didn't watch much of this show. Ah, oh, there's Robert Picardo. I forget which... If it was Deep Space Nine or Voyager that he's in. But Robert Picardo, who's this hologram doctor, he would appear in... Uh, this is an actor who was in The Howling. He was uh, in Inner Space... And Gremlins too. he's the guy at the very end that the female Gremlin wants to go up and kiss. And that's how the movie ends. That's Robert Picardo, this guy here. This hologram doctor. But see, like, okay, we're in this situation where there's this cab miles chase to try and get through these corridors. And it's kind of interesting to taste Star Trek and do a bit of like a, almost a horror film take. Action film take. I thought that was really interesting. Nice change of pace. And that's the thing that like, you're here and you're... Imagine like aliens, right? When it cuts back to somewhere on Earth or somewhere else. Or someone who was left behind on the ship in the Sulaco. Doing some stuff for shits and doodles and humor. And it kind of just interrupts the flow of things. Again, I did it. It's first contact. You gotta establish the importance of that, but... Again, I don't know if there... I don't know. There may be different ways to do it. That's another thing. It's like almost a zombie thing. Where it will infect other crew... And they're too late. Sure, it wasn't too late for you. You got fixed, but... And also, because of the way the board are, that you can shoot them a couple times, but then they get used to it. So it's like, well, fuck, well, now what else can you do? But see, this is what I'm talking about. Like, we're in the middle of this ready-to-fight, ready-to-battle, and now we cut to... Deanna getting drunk. James Cromwell being a drunk. And Jonathan Freight's having to deal with this shit. And Deanna Troy being drunk and some of the humor with that. It's like, the scenes aren't bad. It's not bad, but it's just... Again, it feels like just interrupting the flow that is showcasing. And how to fix it, I don't know. I really don't. But maybe I'm alone in that. Again, it's just... This story just is not nearly as interesting to me as the story on the ship. And Jonathan, F Jonathan Freitz is doing a good job. I mean, three shots of someone called Tequila.
You're blended all right. But yeah, Star Trek Six. I mean, that was the, to me, the actual end of that crew. Fuck Star Trek Generations, and that was a great way to end it. Set to start to the right and straight on till morning. Then Generations, like, hey, let's bring. I don't. Letter Nimoy didn't want to come back, which I don't blame him because it was a stupid strip, with nothing to do. I'm like, why are we doing this? We already had an ending that was the best fit. And it's like, why are you killing off Captain Turk? That's fucking stupid. And then William Shatner later on, oh yeah, it was stupid. Yeah. Go fucking figure. Like I said, this was a hit, and again, it's a good movie. Insurrection was very boring. And Nemesis was like a wannabe Star Trek 2, and wannabe this is like a... And it was directed by a guy who didn't know shit about Star Trek. Even the crew, the, the cast, as you say, did not like the director of Star Trek Nemesis. I think it's the same guy that directed U.S. Marshals. It's a guy that didn't know shit about Star Trek. And the cast, like, what the hell is this guy? Like, why would we get this guy? And, I mean, that could work. Nicholas Meyer didn't know about Star Trek, but he did a good job on Star Trek 2 and helping write Star Trek 6, but not the case on Nemesis. Then years later, he had no movies until J.J. Abrams did his wannabe Star Wars, I'm sorry, Star Trek. Then he did Star Wars. But, uh, what the hell am I... Oh, J.J. Abrams. Sorry, my stomach literally groaned when I mentioned J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. Never was a fan. I don't know how you're doing a prequel, but it's not a prequel because it's like five minutes in, it's an alternate story, alternate timeline. And I'm like, well, what's the point of seeing a younger Kirk and Spock when it's not even... It's still different anyway, so might as well be just different fucking characters. <laughs> oh, because people remember those names. Nostalgia. Even back then. And then... I like the look of the Borg. I think the makeup is well done. Oh, I want to give also credit to Jerry Goldsmith's music. Jerry Goldsmith's music is wonderful. Of course, he did the music in Star Trek The Motion Picture, which is fantastic. He did the music for Star Trek V, which he did a wonderful job on that. Despite issues with Star Trek V, the music is one of the best parts of it. Jerry Goldsmith, my favorite composer, did the first three Rambo films, did the first Alien, like I said, Star Trek The Motion Picture, uh, even uh, Leviathan, this film here. Just love him as a composer. M miss him. Total Recall he did, just a lot of great scores. And this is another good one. I mean, that opening that I was talking through, the opening credits, beautiful music there. And that's what I mean, like, you're in this with this, we got the guns, we, we're traversing through the Enterprise, danger on every side, what's around every corner, and you're like, you're getting into it, and you get into it, and you get into it, then it cuts to, it's like you get this rising possible tension, then it cuts to, James Cromwell is getting drunk again. <laughs> that's, uh, and again, I liked this film. I like that, yeah, Worf, Chief and Shao, bored and shooting them, and some of the crew members sadly didn't take it over, and this whole thing with Picard and him having to overcome his anger and his his past and the situation that's getting more and more hectic for this crew. They would all adapt to that. Oh shit.
That would do it. Nice neck crack from Data. Of course, I mean, to be, I have to be honest, this is why I always liked Kirk more than Picard, because Kirk was more the man of action. I guess that's, great. I, I did, that's what makes Picard different. It makes P Picard more unique. And Patrick Stewart does a good acting job. Great actor. I mean, he was in Life Force, he was in X-Men movies as Xavier. Been a lot of other stuff, but... I was more of a fan of Kirk because of being a man of action. That's why it would have been cool to see like Kirk and Spock and these guys deal with the board. I think that would have been a very cool opportunity. <clears throat> so data's been taken. Which in a way stinks because he's taken fairly early and he's pretty much away from the rest of the crew for a good chunk of it. So again, it's just piling on the <laughs> on the shit sandwich it's like I got people being separated data's been taken but she's going to be enticed to join thanks to the the board queen Alice Creed who was in the new Chainsaw Massacre film I don't know there were people upset about the board queen why the hell do the board have a queen that was never part of a thing uh, I don't to me I guess it worked I think it worked, but again, I'm not the Star Trek Next Generation aficionado. I think Alice Creed did a good job, but for a Borg Queen, she was a little bit sexy, <laughs> I will admit. And this whole, like, Seduction by giving them the ability to feel and well, it definitely gives a bit of an interesting character points for the data character. But now we're back to this whole James Cromwell stuff. And it's like, again, at the end of the day, I don't care. I get why it's important to the plot. I just don't really care. And it's also because, like, you have a chunk of your, a good chunk of your cast never having to deal with the Borg in this situation. Like, writer, Geordie LaForge. They never have to deal with this stuff. Like for them, this mission is almost a piece of cake. <laughs> like they're lucky. It's like, wow, you three lucked out. <laughs> so again, it's like, wow, you three don't really have get to have much to do right now. Sorry, I'm not supposed to be sitting here. Sorry. Do a commentary, you need to talk. <coughs> Apologies for that. <coughs> but I guess you know, I'll talk about another thing I like, which I guess is getting a Blu ray 
May 24th, funny enough, a day before my birthday, uh, this year, May 24th, Truckies, the documentary, the first one is doing a 25th anniversary Blu-ray, I think from Shaw Factory, can't remember the, uh, I don't know why they're not releasing the sequel though, like just put the sequels, but they're not, I think there's like one or two bonus features, so it doesn't feel like much of a 25th anniversary, 25th anniversary thing, but it's nice to if it has a Blu-ray. It was only on DVD. And I'm a big fan of it. But I'm like, well, why can't we have the sequel, too? Just You should just put the fucking sequel on there. Make it a two-pack. Here's Trekkies and Trekkies 2. But I like those documentaries. They're very well... They're very interesting. They're funny. And... I always thought, man, it'd be cool if they did a Trekkies 3, but now that I think about it, that's why you would never see a Trekkies 3. Because what you don't talk about, you don't talk about the bullshit that has happened since then. I mean, can you imagine they did a Trekkies 3 and were honest? Not bullshit, honest. It's like, yeah, I go through the, the JJ films and how even they are even less Star Trek than before. And all that bullshit happening, wannabe Star Wars, lens flares up the ass. Yeah, some again, pretty neat makeup effects. The mixture of human and board. Obviously, because of. They had a bit more of a budget to work with compared to the TV show. Yeah, this is pretty much tannin fodder. <laughs> Man, a shitload of their crew got taken over. I don't know how many is on a crew, but yeah, a shitloader got taken. But yeah, I was saying the if you did Trekkies three, you'd have to talk about how after the the J. J. Adrian, there was a definitely much more of a disconnect for a lot of people. Like, oh, is this Star Trek anymore? This isn't why I get into Star Trek. What some of the people were saying about these films, but I think they're much more apparent in the newer the the J. J. movies. I mean, J. J. didn't direct it, but the third one beyond where. They defeat by the power of the Beastie Boys. <laughs> like they defeat the bad guys by the power of the fucking Beastie Boys. Or whatever the hell that was. You're like, what? And then you'll start your discovery, all the politics, gender politics, all the other bullshit. And then Picard. How that Picard TV show it seemed Hey, Picard's a fool, and fuck you, Picard. I think they actually do say, fuck off, fuck you, or fuck this, fuck that, whatever. I curse a lot, too, but it's not something you really should have in Star Trek. Because then it just, be that's the thing, it just becomes another show. It doesn't, you, when you take away the things that make you unique, it just becomes more generic. That's what people liked about Star Trek is the hope of a better future and a better hopeful civilization. It's my first ray gun. <laughs> I mean, Alfie Woodard is good as the out of her element character. <clears throat> she really does showcase like how one would feel seeing this for the first time. You'd be scared, you'd be in awe, you'd be impressed, all the above. But, uh, 
you know, Picard, like all this stuff going on with Well, we can't have that type of future Gene Roddenberry wanted because with the way the world is today, it's not realistic. It's it's not what would happen. I'm like, that's not the fucking point. So pretty much you just took a shot on Gene Roddenberry's vision and said, nah, that's not how it is. I think even Patrick Stewart said himself that, what was the, like, to look at the future like that is too... I wish I could find the right words on it. There was something about where he, he pretty much disagreeing with Gene Roddenberry's vision, it seemed. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into any more detail. I've, I've seen clips. I've seen footage. I've seen my friends' reviews on it. It just looks like a bullshit show. And the spoiler alert, Picard dies, but then gets a clone body, but the clone body makes him, like, android body makes him to be the same 80-year-old visage, and physique. So, technically, yes, Picard is dead. It's just a fake Picard. Uh, just, like, Why? And you might as well make it, it's almost like they made a Picard and Data were lovers or butt buddies or something. And Alice Creed does a good job, you know, properly stimulated yet. Uh, the emotion chip. I didn't what saying before when Patrick Stewart was touching the ship and Data couldn't understand. But again, this sort of stimulation and almost a sense of bribery. <laughs> you can have this if you help us. Definitely like a weird, crazy... I mean, we just saw her, half her body being carried over by cables to connect to this thing. and Like a weird sexual thing. <laughs> Bork. Sounds Swedish. <laughs> See, that levity works because it's still within the frame, like, well, within the situation. And, like, Alfie Wood is like, man, look at all this. It took me this much to you know, build a four meter thing. You know, how much did this thing cost? I think she does just say, you mean you don't get paid? <laughs> you mean you don't get paid? Yeah. <laughs> just like just that sort of like, what? We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. But then in the new Picard, it's like there's racism and there's... You do drink, like... There is money, like, the, the, in Picard, I swear I saw a scene that there was fucking money involved. And it's like, wait a minute, what about this future that money isn't a thing? Now they say money is a thing. It's like, they didn't... Seeing all the clips, it felt like it's people that didn't know what the fuck any of Star Trek was. Doing a Star Trek show. I don't know, just... But, the, I mean, if you did it honestly and brutally, that's why a Trekkies 3 would be really... You do have people who like it. You want to be fair, but I bet you find a lot of people who don't, and it's like, be honest. Find the people from Trekkies 1 and 2. It's like, we want your honest opinion on the Star Trekker today. 
But you have to be honest, not, I want to be nice on camera because I don't want to hurt people's feelings. Uh, we have the holodeck. I would. Th I think this is one of the the better scenes of the movie. The whole holodeck stuff to make for some really. In I mean, they definitely established that on the show. I mean, it's a cool thing to have a holodeck. I mean. All the things you could do and not do. And this whole thing that if you believe it's real, then you do die. Like, I don't know how you put it. It's a holodeck, it's holograms, it's fake, but at the same time it could be real as on top of it. I mean, hell, if you had a holodeck, you probably would never leave there, if that's the case. <laughs> Because you do anything. Nicky the nose. With this weird metal thing on his... Well, that's why he's called the nose. But like yeah, this weird metal thing. It is a weird choice, though, that you, this guy has, like, a metal nose. It's like, why? Unless that was something established before, but it's just like, why? It just looks goofy, even for this... That looks goofier than the Borg. And I don't think the Borg looks goofy, that's why I say that. How many times did you get to see Patrick Stewart with a Tommy gun wasting board? Disengage the safety protocols. Without them, even a holographic bullet can kill. I just, why would you not have safety protocols the whole time? Why would there even be a thing to shut them off? I mean, now that I think about it, is there, uh, other than this situation, is there a reason to never have safety protocols? Because Alfie Wooder realizes, well, wait a minute, this is one of your crew, and he's just on this... Was deemed to him a self-destructive mission, like Moby Dick, which comes into play later. But it's like, okay, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. What's going to happen? Oh, now we're back to fucking James Cromwell's a drunk. He can't even be allowed to take a piss. Here's Joy LaForge telling him about all this stuff. I think this is where he tells about the statue. Again, the, the acting is not the problem. It's just, oh, there's Dwight Schultz from uh, the A Team, Murdoch. He appeared in a lot, he appeared in a couple episodes of Star Trek Next Generation. Yeah, Reggie, right? But I forgot he was, Dwight Schultz was in the movie, though, too. But yeah, that's uh, Murdoch from the A Team. I, yeah, I forgot he was in the movie, but 
always I see Dwight Dwight Schultz because I'm a big A Team fan. I have it on I have them on DVD over there, thanks to my good friend Efri, if he's watching. Thank you so much for that. I still have them right over there. Great gift. The fifth season is not a great season, but I can still watch episodes. But the first four are great. But yeah, man, I'm like I'm still like wow. I did not. I forgot Dwight Schultz was in this. He was also in this film from the 80s called Alone in the Dark with Jack Palance and Donald Pleasance. Pretty decent horror film. I, f I don't know how many episodes he was on The Next Generation. I know he appeared a couple times though. Maybe these scenes would work in a different movie? But again, it's just, you go, but it's like this here is trying to be humor from Star Trek 4, you know, that sense of humor, not understanding modern talk, modern vocabulary. Double dumbass on you. That's what it seems like with this bit here. And then you go back to this again. Horror action feel to it. It's like. To me it's such different tones. That just. Not sure if they fit the best together. And imagine. Again imagine Star Trek 2. And. In the middle of the fight between them and Khan, and then you cut to, I don't know, someone is somewhere saying the same dialogue from Star Trek 4. Zero G combat training. <laughs> That's what I mean. Each time it goes back here, it, it to me it's like okay, another really interesting bit. More of the crew is being taken over. Oh, now we have the holodeck scene and Tommy Dunn firing and uh, the stuff with between Alfie Woodard and Picard. Now we have the zero G battle. Which I remember in one of the early scripts of Alien 3 by William Gibson. Not the one they released stupidly for comic book and audio. Like an earlier, more expensive version of that script. There was like a zero-G gravity fight between like Hicks and the Xenomorphs and, and such. Yeah, there's, there's a layer where Worf goes, assimilate this. <clears throat> Again, the stuff between Alfie Woodard and Picard, I think, are pretty nice little moments. And, like, this idea, like, the fact that because it, you're walking on the, <laughs> underneath the, the ship... Which is just, imagine it's just a case of vertigo, but in your eyes, you just walked in on a flat space. Yeah, just like here. You're just walking forward, that's all you're doing. It's just a nice guy. That's how you gotta look at it. You just. Again, the effects here are pretty good for 1996. But that's a nice wide, like, pan back of the shot. Like I said, I don't know why the, the DVD doesn't say what's the features on this, but there is a disc too. And uh I don't know if I ever 
I don't know if they're newer f interviews. I might check it after I'm done with this. <clears throat> yeah, but the Star Trek today, I don't think it'll ever go back to what it was because you think of the people involved with it, you think of the people who own it, you think of the people that are controlling it now that just don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And. Star Trek is now a different animal, a different beast. And doesn't really represent what it was supposed to the whole time. You just say, well, in this movie, it's not like it's talking about deep themes. But at the same time, even within this, it's talking about Picard having to overcome his anger and move on. This thing with Data... It, he wants to be human desperately. Is it worth it? Damn. Data learned some Steven Seagal moves. I mean, Alice Creed is doing a really good job. She's definitely, I think, one of the better villains in the Star Trek movies. Seductive nature. Hey, if you think that skin's not worth it, like a defective circuit, just tear it off. See, you don't want to, because you want it. Desire. Lust, greed, whatever you want. to. All seven deadly sins. I just would really assume they got laid, or she lays into him, so to speak. I didn't, like, very weird but interesting. It's like, uh, different turn of events, so to speak. In other words, Data got laid. And there was no short circuit. Oh, short. No, I'm just a different kind of short. <clears throat> and it's like, I don't want to go back to this fucking thing with these two guys running around the fucking park after James Cromwell, who's looking for Babe. Because he, he wants to tell him, thou do, pig, thou do. Sacked his ass. Yeah, still looking to take a piss? Although that's not really a smart idea to stun him there. Like, what if he fell and hit his head and was dead? I mean, if you think about it, like, he could have fell, clunk, and then he's dead as fuck. I mean, maybe it's like, hey, it's, uh... You lessen the tension by having these little funny bits... I don't know, I just... 
I'll say one last time. They're not bad. It's just, to me, it screws with the flow of the movie for me. Just like, this is the stuff I'm the most interested in. And in this, these scenarios. Now, you know, this Neil Madonna, we've never seen him before. He's not part of the original crew, so he is what we call expendable. He's an expendable asset to use to get the job done. Got it. It's like the red shirts in the original Star Trek. For the most part, if you wore a red shirt, it's like here's Kirk, Spot, Bones, Scotty, and Fred. And Fred has a red shirt. It's like... Fred's dead, baby. Fred's dead. Of course, you're going to all the things of, well... This is space, how would you be able to hear sound in space, and this and that. Obviously the movie's not trying to go for that type of... <laughs> it's Star Trek, it's not going for that type of realism. Of what you can and can't do in space. Yeah, this stuff always gotta be so complicated, it's like an alien. Remember the first alien, where Ripley had all those fucking things, she had a... Each one by one. I guess if it was that easy, then anyone could do it, and you wouldn't want that. <clears throat> I don't mind the suits. The spacesuits, <clears throat> pretty decent looking, costume wise. Picard's smart enough to do this. Took care of that guy. <clears throat> See, that's what Worf should have done. <clears throat> yeah, sorry about that. Kicked his ass. Come on, Worf, kicked his ass. He can't quite get, get the job done. <clears throat> so you fucked up, man. You fucked up. This is why you die. Like Picard's like, oh well. <laughs> I better get this shit done. That guy fucked up. I gotta fix his fucking mistake. I was gonna say you just go up the thing and fly like an eagle. Sorry, bitch. I'm gonna fly like an eagle. Please don't try to send me out. I'm gonna fly. The fits deal with dumbasses. Mistake. I have fits deal with dumbass. He's floating away. I have fits his mistake, and now he has got to pay. He's flying high into the sun. I'm going to have me some fun. I gotta get this shit done, because he couldn't do it, the fuck kid. I knew he was a dumbass Gorman. Knew him a dumbass. There you go. South. Fucking Nora, pal.
Aw, oh, the dumbass. How the hell did you... How did you become a Borg without your suit being fucked up? Wouldn't initially the suit... It would be punctured and you would be decompressed before you changed? I mean, I know the others, the board don't need the suit, but you would initially, there wouldn't still be stuff blowing, I don't know, maybe not. <clears throat> Doesn't warp it, yeah, assimilate this. Which other word? Crowd pleasing moment. Sorry, just looking. We got about 36 minutes left. And sorry I'm not saying anything. That's the thing with these commentaries. I don't quite know what to say all the way through. Because I didn't make the film. I mean I could read off random trivia. But it's just trivia you did not mind to be. And I guess I could. So it's not completely. I mean, that's the thing, like, at the very least, James Cromwell is given a very good performance as this guy that, you know, you guys have this holier-than-thou attitude about me, and I'm far from it. And it's like, I just wanted to get paid, you know. Which I think, you know, a lot of people, they go in that situation, but... They just fall into more successful ventures. Don't try to be a great man, just be a man. Due to budget, let's see, due to budgetary restraints, the crew of Star Trek The Next Generation was never quite satisfied with the board sets and costumes used in the TV series. Bigger budget for the film finally allowed them to design the board in a way that was much closer to what they intended. Yeah, I agree with that. Whoopi Goldberg was not asked to return as Dinan. She only learned about the decision through the newspapers. She said, what can I say? I want to do it because I didn't think you could do anything about the board without my character. But apparently you can, so they don't need me. <laughs> Does I fuck you, Whoopi Goldberg? Ah, uh, here's, here's this Moby Dick mentality that the ship can't go down and he gets this Obsession, <clears throat> which is true. You never tell a clean on you're afraid, or you never call a clean on coward. The board queen was created because the writers were having difficulty in writing dialogue for what was intended to be the board's central computer. 
That's understandable. I actually don't mind the, the idea. In early drafts, Picard was supposed to be the one helping James Cromwell on Earth while Reiter was fighting the border on the Enterprise. The main story was also focused on the happenings on Earth. Patrick Stewart said, no, fuck that. Characters of Reiter and Picard were swapped. And Picard was a bit more of an action hero. Ah, uh, this, this is like one of the be better scenes in the movie. Alfie Woodard calling on Patrick Stewart's bullshit. <coughs> this is where he does a bit of bastard about what happened to him. Which was in, I believe, a two-part episode of Star Trek That Generation. <laughs> oh, that was a bullshit. But at least, like, this dialogue is more depth than anything you get in New Star Trek. Captain Ahab has to go hunt his whale. Sorry, I'll get to that in a minute, but... This stuff in a minute, but... And this is the big speech that people remember. Because Stewart sells it. Oh, and that sacrifice the Enterprise. Too many compromises already. Too many retreats. They invade our space. And we fall back. They assimilate entire worlds. And we fall back. Not again. The line must be drawn here. This far. No further. And I will make the pay for what they've done. I hate to say it, but I'm kind of on his side on this frame of mind. I know that's not supposed to be the right frame of mind, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of on his frame of mind in that instance. And yeah, I know I'm not supposed to, but my, he made sense. See. Michael Dorn, Brent Spiner, Gates McFadden, and Jonathan Frace have all been quoted saying that this was their favorite of all the four films they made. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just enjoying Patrick Stewart's performance in this. Guess he didn't know when to quit. I would still keep the gun, but that's just me.
After Stretcher Generations, Warp became a crew member of D Space Nines. So you go. That's when that happened. See, there's a lot of info, but I'm trying to go through stuff that talks about the story. A lot of this, like technical stuff. So one possible title was Star Trek Resurrection, but then they realized that Foss was doing Alien Resurrection, which would be come out the year after. Well, if it did, it'd be one of the few films worth a shit with Resurrection in the title. Because yeah. You know, Alien Resurrection is pretty shitty. Can't try and sorry, I'm just looking. Okay, development. In December 92, Paramount approached producer Rip Berman and engaged him to create two films featuring the cast of the TV series. This was 92. Rip Berman developed two screenplays at the same time. B Brian Braga and Ronald D. Moore were chosen to help write. First they did Start Your Generations. That was a bad call. This should have been the first one. That's what... This should have been the first... Fuck Generations. This should have been the first one. Why the fuck they pit the other one? Oh, because Captain Kirk. Yeah, he's barely in it for five minutes and he dies. So, whoever said yes to that is an idiot. So, Rip Berman wanted a story on time travel. Broader and more one one on the board, so it was like, why not do both? Let's see. Let's see. In one draft, Picard has a love interest in the local photographer Ruby, while Riker leads the fight against the board on the Enterprise. Another draft included John Delancey's character Q. Just didn't make sense that Picard, the one guy who has a history with the board, never meets them. Yeah, I agree. That would have been horrible. The film was given a $45 million budget. Accessible story, worked as a standalone. Ridley Scott and John McTiernan turned down the project. <laughs> Frey had directed multiple episodes of Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, but first contact was his first feature film. Other titles, Star Trek Board, Star Trek Destiny, Star Trek Future Generation, Star Trek Generations 2. Fuck, really? That was a title? Start your resurrection. My crew risks everything to save me. There's someone still on the ship. I owe him the same.
be an Alfie Woodard Picard. That's a nice, uh, very nice. This is nice scenes between the two. Definitely some of the highlights of the film. Let's see, this is about the filming of the movie, the effects of the movie, music, Jared Goldsmith, great job, man. Let's see, release. 1996. The franchise was on rocky ground. Ratings for Deep Space Nine Voyager had shed millions of viewers, being bested by Hercules the Legendary Journeys as the highest rated syndicated series. Some fans remain upset Paramount canceled Next Generation at the height of its popularity. Generations was a commercial success, but not critically praised. This film was heavily marketed. Several novelizations, Playmate toys, 6 and 9 inch action figures, two making of TV specials on HBO and Sci-Fi Channel, a 30th anniversary TV special on UPN. Trailer to the film was included on the Best of Star Trek music compilation. That's strange. Board themed video game for Macintosh and Windows. Star Trek Board. What was the one? There was a... There was a Star Trek first person shooter. I forgot what the fuck that was called. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, critical response, positive reviews. Nominated for Best Makeup at the Academy Awards. Let's see. And I'm looking at the box office. November 22, 1996, $146 million. Go to the end here. Okay, there, there is no. Okay. You want a human being with a mind of his own who could bridge the gulf between humanity and board, a counterpart. Yeah, I'm pausing because now, God, that original idea that Riker would be fine the board. Yeah, I don't know why they wrote that in the first place. God, could you imagine that? And, like, apparently this was going to be the secondary plot? I'm glad cooler heads prevailed. I just did everything in Star Trek Resurrections because it was Generations, so yeah, that similar simpatico. And this weird, like, jigsaw, like, leather face, fucking leather face data. Just these are whole human, you know, skin mask. And where did that skin come from, by the way? Imagine they ripped that skin off of someone to put it on there. Obviously not. Resistance is futile. I 
And that looks like a dick. <laughs> What's well, a rocket? What do you expect? But yeah, I mean, this was a big hit, and then they follow up with Insurrection, which is just a boring story. Such a boring story. And that's a film that I've seen and I've reviewed, and I don't fucking remember most of it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm serious, like, it's a colony, fountain of youth, and... I'm sure, well, I guess either, but Insurrection probably would, probably is a longer, like a longer episode of the, the TV show, and that might be, <laughs> that's one of the weaker ones. Maybe it's something that works on a TV episode just doesn't work for a movie, because in a movie people do expect a bit more, and... That's understandable. I think that's perfectly understandable. Because you're hoping with a bigger budget, bigger production value, a bigger scope. You think Riker and the uh, Geordi would notice these uh, things coming at them, but they're doing no maneuver, no maneuvering. Well, I guess they don't have the, the systems for that. And that's the thing, like, Picard goes all the way here, but he doesn't really do anything. Like, if you think about it, that's another thing, like, Picard... It's like, okay, we're going to try to make him an action hero, but he doesn't really do anything. Like, he gets caught, he gets tied up, he's climbing. But you see, he doesn't really, quote, do anything. And like, with Data, if Picard didn't come back, would Data have still done that, or not? Would Data have still... What would Data have done if Picard didn't come back? Would Data be like, okay, sure, I'll do this. Or, you know what, I'm going to try to take these suckers out by myself and, I don't know, blow up the ship? Like, I didn't... Made me go, what would happen? Because, again, Picard doesn't really do anything, if you think about it. Like, what does he actually do here? He doesn't kill the Borg Queen. Well, I think you could have at least had him kill the Borg Queen. Even like what Captain Kirk did at the end of Star Trek 3. I have had enough of you. Have something like that. A punch, a kick, something. But yeah, I know he's not Kirk, he's Picard. But it's like... What did he really do at the end? If you think about what did he actually do? Data did everything. I mean, you say Picard came back, but Picard came back to do what? To get caught and climb. Caught and climb. I mean, yeah, you know, what did he actually do? If they made it more apparent that him being there is what changed Data's mind... But they don't really go into that. Not at all. So. It's like, what the hell? Thank God ever, they were all on this one bit of the fucking place.
that wannabe Terminator. Sorry, I'm listening to the dialogue. <clears throat> 0 0.68 seconds, sir. For an android. That is nearly an eternity. But uh, like if it was like them working together, cool, but they didn't work together. It's like Data did all the work and the captain was just there. <laughs> and it's like, again, had the captain helped Data do something or, I don't know, Picard hits the thing and climbs up and Data pulls the queen down or Data hits the thing and Picard hits her, well, she's, I don't know, stops her before she escapes, something, man, at least a little bit something more for Picard to do, that's really, what, Picard didn't do anything, uh, if, if people think I'm wrong, feel they, uh, explain the comments, explain the comments, of course, this is the first time that you realize it's with Vulcans, So, yeah, like I've said before, I'll say it again. Growing up, I enjoyed the original Star Trek series because I enjoyed the characters. Kirk and McCoy and Spock and their interactions with each other. Kirk, I did enjoy as more of you know, being that action hero, fist of cuffs, all that stuff. But William Shatner, his uh, bravura, they even say that word right. I mean, this is almost like, okay, like, in the movies, I want Picard to be a little bit more like Kirk, so have him do a little bit more action. So, you know, there you go. But yeah, this is still a good movie. Solid production values. Interesting story. Nice usage of the board. Cast do a great job. Wonderful music by Jerry Goldsmith. And let's see how I put it. It's one of those things that compared to today, I mean today Star Trek is you might as well say non existent. You have terrible animation shows that think they're family guy. You have T V shows that or just STD bullshit. You have Picard shows that just seem such a slap in the face to the character. I feel bad for anyone who's a hardcore fan of Next Generation because it seems like they fucked you. Well, they fucked every fucking franchise in the ass.
I wonder why they didn't let Alfie Warder have like one more word to Picard. Like she doesn't say anything. Like whether it be playful or smart ass or anything of the sort. They just didn't have her say any dialogue. It's like writer writer Jordy, you missed everything. And how many people did die on the crew? I mean, there's a shitload. So does that mean all the dead bodies are still there waiting for... Take them off the ship? All those dead bodies? And so were all the board... All those board members... They're in that one spot. They were nowhere else on the ship. Nowhere else on the ship. They were all in that one central spot. Where that green mist came out. Like there were nowhere else on the ship. I guess not. You think for tactics be somewhere else. But I guess they were all in the same spot. For that green mist to encapsulate them. <coughs> okay. With the trees and stuff. And Jerry Gold's was music basically to Star Trek 5. Show me the way to go home. Ashes, row, row, row your boat jelly down the stream. But yeah, that's Star Trek First Contact. Patrick Stewart, Jonathan Frace, Brent Spiner, LeVar Burton, Michael Dorn. It just weird, like, LeVar Burton, Jonathan Frace, they had nothing to do with the main, you know, story. Yeah, it was Neil Madonna, Dwight Schultz, Robert Picardo. Oh, computer, the computer voice was Medjool Barrett. But in great music by Jerry Goldsmith, may you rest in peace. But yeah, it's still, still a pretty damn good movie. Like I said, I have issues here and there. Oh, Joel Goldsmith did some additional music. Cool. But. I said good movie. I still have issues. It's not my favorite Star Trek film. It's not in my top five. It'd probably be four. What would be my top five? Four is number one. I would go with four. Think about it. Four, one, six, three, and then two. Four, one, six, three, two. I would go with that. Because I really like the motion picture. I wish the special longer version was available, not just on a fucking VHS tape. Paramount, you pair of pricks. But hey, what do I know? But I don't know what else to say. Thanks you guys for watching. Take care. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.